Okay, let's start this session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this DP420 session. Myself, Archie said I'm a host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We'll be there to help you out. Now moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is in India one of kind co-coaching learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, the Bruce about offering also give comprehensive advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, Emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solutions, sales and research training, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what does Microsoft certification does? It will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained to build a paper for the exam and get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role-based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental level certification, we are providing you AJ900, AI900, DP900, PL900, and SC900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you AZ305, SC100, PL600, AZ400. Also, we have special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. Certification offering. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Then move it, uh, moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech community for Punekas. Emerging technology community for Suratkas. Azure Tech community for Nakpukas. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that par participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. Uh, we will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Uh, today's speaker for this training is Sonu Satyadas. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently works with Synergetics as a practice head. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In this session, we are providing you DP420 Learning Achievement Badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming uh, events and webinars. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic. Our speaker, he will continue ahead. Okay, thank you, Archie. Hello, everyone. I hope I am audible to all of you. Yeah, myself, uh, Sonu Satidas, and I'm the Assistant Manager Technology at Synergetics. <clears throat> and uh, this session specifically, uh, the DP420 is designing and implementing the cloud native applications using Cosmos DB. This is 
Okay, let me share the screen. So I hope this uh, is visible to all of you. So this session is primarily focusing on the database service that is Cosmos DB, which talks about how to provision the Cosmos DB, how to configure the uh, settings in Cosmos DB, how to connect to the applications, what are the different integrations possible with Cosmos DB, how we can replicate the data into different uh, regions, how to configure the con con consistency levels, as well as uh, 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 writing the server-side code, like uh, procedures, functions, and triggers in Cosmos DB. So this course is primarily containing 13 modules. I'll show you the list of modules. So you can see the course outline. This, uh, as I have mentioned, this course contains primarily 13 modules. The first module is talking about how to get started with the Cosmos DB. So how we can create and deploy the Cosmos DB database. So this is a multi-model database, but here in this certification, we'll be primarily focusing only on the NoSQL API. So I'll explain about the different types of APIs uh, when we start this first module. In the second module, we will be talking about how we can configure the capacity for the Cosmos DB database and containers, how to provision the read write capacity, how to uh, provision the database in serverless mode, and so on. In the module three, we understand how to connect a Cosmos DB database uh, from our application. So what are the different approaches we can use to connect to the Cosmos DB database? So what are the different SDKs available to, uh, to connect with the Cosmos DB account? So in fourth module, it's an extension of the third module how to perform the CRUD operations with uh, Cosmos DB. And fifth module is how to perform the SQL queries because it's uh, uh, providing a SQL type of query for querying the data from Cosmos DB. We'll understand more about the uh, querying process in module five. And module six is about the indexing of data in Cosmos DB. So what are the different uh, uh, indexing strategies supported by Cosmos DB? Module seven is uh, all about how to integrate Cosmos DB with the other Azure services, because this is one of the uh, common data storage for most of the uh, solutions like uh, AI, ML, IoT solutions, analytic solutions, uh, data science solutions. So wherever you want uh, low latency data access, a hierarchical data storage, we can use the Cosmos DB. So we'll understand what are the different services we can connect with Cosmos DB. And module eight will be understanding the different partitioning strategies so what is partitioning? How we can store the data in different partitions? What is the best practice for selecting a partition key? So these things will be discussed in module eight. In module nine, 
will be understanding the replication strategy like how we can enable the geo replication and replicate the data into different uh, uh, data centers and how to ensure that uh, failover happens uh, whenever there is a down uh, downtime uh, occurs in the primary region how it uh, fail over to the secondary region how we can configure the automatic and manual failover so that comes in the module 9 and in module 10 we talks about the performance optimization module 11 is about monitoring and troubleshooting the cosmos db database module 12 is uh, how to use uh, cosmos db with the devops solutions and finally we'll be uh, ending the session with the server side programming that is uh, creating the stored procedures functions and triggers in cosmos db so these are the different modules covered in the DP420. But yes, uh, since it is uh, a one day session, it's not possible to cover all the modules here. But yes, we'll be covering some selective mod selected modules. So we'll understand how Cosmos DB can be created and connected with applications and what are the different uh, configuration options available in Cosmos DB. So let's get started with the first module. Okay, let's uh, uh, understand in this today's session, we will be having uh, this is a full day session, but uh, yes, we will be having some breaks. So after the first one or two modules, we'll be taking a break and we'll have a lunch session uh, for means lunch break for one hour. And after that evening, we'll have another 10, 15 minutes break uh, before winding up the session. So let's get started with the first module. The first module is get started with the Azure Cosmos DB for no SQL. So maybe most of you or at least some of you must be aware that we have uh, different types of uh, no SQL databases available. So no SQL is a kind of data storage In NoSQL database category, we have document storages, we have key value data storages, we have column family data storage, and also we have graph databases. So when we build an application, we identify the kind of data that we have to store, understand the nature and structure of the data. And then we will select the appropriate uh, uh, storage solution. So if your data is more structured, then you can go with the relational database. But if it is semi-structured or unstructured data, then you will be selecting a no SQL database solution. Primarily, a document storage or a key value storage, or it can be the graph database or column family type. As everyone knows, uh, the most commonly used uh, no SQL database type is document storage. 
like a MongoDB, which is also storing the data in document JSON document format. We have other uh, document storage solutions in every cloud. Uh, but in some cases, we go with the key value database solutions like uh, Azure Table API. Or in AWS, we have DynamoDB. Or we have open source Redis database. So all these stores the data in the key value format. But if you store it, or if you if you are planning to store the data in a column family approach, we can use the Apache Cassandra. And for graph type of data, we can use Neo4j or uh, Apache Tinkerpop, that is Gremlin APIs. So there are different different uh, database, NoSQL database solutions available. So in this, we will understand the database options available in or the database uh, uh, APIs, which is supported by uh, Cosmos DB. And also we will understand how to work with the document storage, that is the NoSQL database option. So yes, to start with the database technologies, we always need to understand what are the different uh, types of data storages uh, we are storing. As I have mentioned, we uh, go with relational databases if you have a structured data, like uh, employee information, student information, something like that. But if your data is not in a structured manner, it doesn't have a specific schema or structure. Means the data is in a hierarchical format. Then you can go with the known relational databases. So there are different known relational databases. We simply call them NoSQL databases. As I have mentioned, it can be a graph or key value or column family or document storage. So typically this data is stored in JSON document format. They doesn't have a particular schema. They are simply schema less, which means if you are storing the details of one entity, an entity can be maybe a, a person or object or location, or anything. So if you store the information about a particular entity in JSON format, it will have scalar values, arrays, or nested objects. Because the JSON uh, format, if you see, it will have a scalar values, collections, or nested objects inside it. And every entity within the JSON document may have different uh, attributes. Maybe the uh, number of uh, items in a collection can be different for different uh, entries. For example, if I'm storing the order informations into a JSON database, there is an order ID, order name, sorry, uh, customer name, order date, and the bill amount. For every order, these are the common values. But there will be a list of items which is part of that order. It will be a collection. So order items will be a collection type, and it will contain the objects in that collection. That is, what are the different uh, items ordered in that particular order? But if you see, uh, if you compare two different orders, 
they will have different number of items maybe some orders may have five items some orders may have two items some orders may have more than that so that means there is no fixed structure for that that's why we call it as schema less so what is the benefit of using this type of databases that is non relational schema less databases is it is better to scale out scale out is a uh, scaling strategy so if you are familiar with the infrastructure uh, configurations you can understand we typically do scaling in two ways scale out and scale up so if you increase the capacity of an existing server we call it a scale up but if you increase the number of servers for handling more number of uh, request then it's called a scale out these no sql databases supports partitioning which allows us to store the data into different uh, partitions different uh, servers so it is very easy for us to scale out our database means instead of storing all the records into a single server we can create a list of servers that runs behind the load balancer so when we use the managed database servers like a cosmos db it will automatically configure the load balancers and the number of instances so as the uh, number of uh, records increases it will automatically partition the data and create more servers so we can say the no sql databases are better for scale out as i have mentioned you can see the no sql data models can be a document type which is primarily a json hierarchical structure or it can be a key value format means for every key there is a corresponding value associated with it or it can be a column family means one entry can have a related set of values or it can be a graph type where the data is represented in the form of edges and vertices the cosmos db supports different uh, types of apis no sql apis if you go to the cosmos db's documentation you can see that it is says cosmos db supports different database apis such as azure cosmos db for no sql azure cosmos db for mongo db azure cosmos db for cassandra azure cosmos db for table api and azure cosmos db for graph api now it also supports the postgresql which is also storing the data in a no sql format so now as per the latest updates i think there are six apis supported that is microsoft uh microsoft's own no sql format that is uh previously it was called core sql but now it is called a simply no sql and it also supports the uh, mongo db api the apache cassandra database api gremlin that is graph api and also now it supports postgre sql api but in this modules we will be talking about only one type of 
API, that is the Microsoft's own API type, that is Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL is a document type of data storage, which means it is storing the data in JSON document format, something similar to the MongoDB, because how MongoDB is storing the data. MongoDB is storing the data in the JSON format, which is the binary JSON format. Similarly, the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL is also storing the data in JSON document format. So if you go to the Azure portal and try to create a Cosmos DB account, you will be able to see the different APIs which are supported here. You can see which API is best suited for your workload. Accordingly, you can select the appropriate API type. So here you can see this is the Microsoft's own API that is Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So this is the Cosmos DB's na native API type and it uh, supports SQL type of query language. Means if you want to retrieve the data, you can use the SQL type of query syntax. And it uh, supports uh, SDK for most of the programming languages. But yes, if you are already using some NoSQL databases on-premise, like uh, suppose you are you you ha already having an application which is uh, running in the running from the on premise servers from last 10 15 years maybe it uses uh, cassandra database or maybe gremlin that is graph or mongodb you can easily migrate this databases to the cloud by using cosmos db so if you are planning to migrate existing on-premise applications to the cloud, then you can go for the other API types. But if you are planning to build a fresh new cloud native application, then it is always recommended to use the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So this is one of the questions that everyone asked. So which API I have to use? because Cosmos DB supports different APIs. So answer is very simple. If you are planning to build a fresh new cloud native application, then you have to go with a Cosmos DB for NoSQL. But if you are planning to migrate some existing applications to the cloud, then you can go for the other API types. For example, if you already have a MongoDB application, that runs on premise, you can use the Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB. So then the question, so can we use MongoDB for new applications? But yes, you can use, no problem. But what is the benefit of using the NoSQL API? That is Microsoft's own NoSQL API. This is the only service, only API type that supports integration with the many other AI service, sorry, many other Azure services like uh, AI services, machine learning services, data science services, analytic services, logging services. So whenever you want to integrate your Cosmos DB with other services, you, then you have to use NoSQL because if you create a uh, Cosmos DB account using MongoDB or Cassandra or table, it does not uh, support integration with other Azure services. So for cloud native applications, you always need to use Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL.
So here we have clarified why we have to go for Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL than the other APIs which are also supported under Cosmos DB. So why or what is Cosmos DB for NoSQL? So this is a fast, fully managed NoSQL database service that supports different features like a rich querying over diverse data. It helps delivering deliver configurable and reliable performance globally distributed, enables rapid development, guaranteed a single digit millisecond response times, 99.999% availability, and SLA for four parameters like a throughput, consistency, availability, and latency. So considering these points, the first point, rich querying over diverse data. If you are a developer who works in the relational databases, you can understand that uh, all the developers will be mostly familiar with the SQL query syntax. Suppose if you want to read the data, you can use the SQL query syntax. But when you switch to a NoSQL database type, because it is NoSQL, it does not support the relational database SQL queries because here the data is not a structured data. Here it is a semi-structured data. So it does not support the SQL query. But if you go with the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL, you can still use the SQL type of query. I'm not saying the SQL query. SQL-like query syntax you can use to read the data from the Cosmos DB database. And you can configure the conditions, projections, aggregations inside the query. The same way how we write the SQL query, we can define the aggregations, projections, conditions, everything inside the query. So your, even your data is in the JSON format, means hierarchical format, still you can go and use the SQL-like syntax for querying the data. So what is the benefit? The developers who migrates from uh, the traditional relational databases to NoSQL will not feel that difficulty because the querying syntax or querying pattern looks similar. If you consider the second one, helps deliver configurable and reliable performance. So Cosmos DB supports different uh, consistency levels for offering better performance for your applications. You can configure either the eventual consist, uh, consistent prefix, session, bounded staleness, or strong consistency level. There are five consistency levels which you can configure. So according to the application's type, what kind of data it handles, you can configure the uh, consistency levels. And also, you can configure the capacity. You can configure the read and write capacity for your database. Means what is the capacity that you want to allocate for your database or to a single container? You can do that. That is, that is called a RU. RU means request unit. So request unit is a unit for specifying the capacity or throughput capacity for your database. So if you want, you can allocate the throughput capacity on a database level or in the table level or maybe the container level. 
it is globally distributed which means if you want you can create a primary database in one location and by using the geo replication feature you can replicate the data into different uh, other regions so more than one regions in more than one regions you can configure the uh, date uh, replication enables rapid development you can use the SDK supported by different languages for building these applications. And also, the code templates are available in the portal as well as in the uh, Git repositories, GitHub repositories. So if you want, you can generate the code and uh, complete your development in less time. Guaranteed single digit milliseconds response time. So, this database is providing SLA owned throughput and latency. What is the benefit of that? This will ensure that the read or write operations are completed within the specific time period. So, according to the SLA, every write operation and read operation completes within 10 milliseconds. That is the guaranteed uh, throughput and latency offered by Cosmos DB. The high availability is 99.999 percentage. That means when you create a Cosmos DB database, your database is replicated uh, into two other locations. Location means within the data center, there will be two more copies will be created. Yes, you can configure the geo replication, but that is manually configured. But there are two automatic replicas created for high availability. So in case if your primary copy is uh, uh, unavailable, then one of the secondary will be promoted as the primary. So it will ensure the high availability of your database. And unlike the other Azure services, which is providing the SLA on uh, high availability, uh, the Cosmos DB is providing SLA on four parameters. So mostly all the cloud services, whether it is VM, App Service, SQL database, or maybe any other uh, service you see, they will be providing SLA, that is service level agreement, only on the availability parameter. That, that is a high availability. So high availability can be 99.90, 99.95, 99 99.99, like that. But in Cosmos DB, they provide SLA on four parameters, throughput, consistency, high availability, and latency. Now, if you come to the Cosmos DB for NoSQL database, how the database is organized? What are the different components in a Cosmos DB account? See, at the top level, we have the Cosmos DB account. That is the database account. So when you create an instance in Azure portal, you will be creating a Cosmos DB account or a database account. That database account is providing an endpoint for connecting to the databases, which is located inside that account. So the database account or Cosmos DB account provides a URI and an authentication key 
through which you can connect to the database server. So you can simply say the database account is something similar to your relational database server. And inside the account, we can have multiple databases. You can have any number of databases inside the single account. But yes, for different uh, use cases, it is better to create different uh, database accounts. But if all the database or all the data is related to a single project, yes, you can go and use a single database account and create multiple databases inside it. Inside the database, we can have one or more containers. So container is nothing but uh, something similar to the tables in a relational database. Okay. So here, This database account is, you can say it is the server. Which is allowing the users to connect to the databases. And these databases is similar to our relational database databases. Inside this databases, we have containers, which is something similar to the tables. So table means we will have multiple records inside the relational database tables. Similarly, we have multiple items inside the container because container is something similar to the table. For example, if I have to store the employees information, we create an employees table. But here we will create an employees collection or employees container. If I have to store the order details in relational database, we create an orders table. But here it is orders container. If I have to store the details of accounts, we'll be creating the accounts container. So inside this container, we can have a item. So item is sim simply represents a entity. Okay, that means. In relational database, we can relate to a record. So one item means one record. But understand, each item is in the JSON format. Each item is in the JSON format. So inside the container, we can have a multiple uh, items. Okay. But if you create a Cosmos DB for MongoDB account. The structure looks similar, like we will have a database account. Inside the database account, we will have the database. Inside the database, we will have a collection. Instead of container, in MongoDB, we call it as collection. Inside the collection, we will have the document. But here, it is called an item. Okay. So right side, you can see an example of item. So how the item looks like. So item is a JSON document. You can see it uh, contains an ID. So every document or every item contains a unique ID. So ID can be a GUID type of ID or it can be any unique string value. So anyway, there should be an ID value and you can have a, any number of other attributes. And when you create a new item, means a new document, Cosmos DB automatically adds some additional attributes, additional fields in, into that. Okay, we will see what are the additional fields that Cosmos DB is adding to the items. So when should you use 
Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. To support applications that require a database platform that is very flexible, that has a low response time, globally available, processing transactions at massive volume or velocity, elastically scalable to meet the application needs. So the question is when or why we have to use Azure Cosmos DB. First of all, this is flexible. You can access your database and perform the operations either by using SDK or using the REST APIs. And SDK is available for almost every language. And this is simply configurable, means according to your application type, you can configure the capacity as well as uh, consistency levels. It has a low response time. Since it is using high performance SSD for storing the data and using a high performance network transfer, accelerated network transfer, the response time will be very low. So they are providing an SLA on latency also. That means every operation will be completed within 10 milliseconds. This is globally available service. You can access your database from anywhere. And not only that, you can even replicate your data into other regions. And you can read the data from those regions. So usually it is supporting one primary region and multiple secondary regions. Means the primary region will be containing all the read write operations. Okay, and the secondary regions can be used to read the data, but it does not support the write operations. But there is an option available in Cosmos DB which supports multi-region writes. Multi-region writes means you can write the data into any region, not only in the primary region. So in that case, there is no primary secondary concept because every region is a writable region. Okay. But yes, uh, you may be wondering then, then how the uh, consistency will be maintained because there can be some right conflicts. So that, that will be uh, resolved by using the uh, last right wins strategy. So that is the approach they follow for handling the consistency and uh, right conflicts. Processing transactions at massive volume or velocity. So the power of Cosmos DB is that it can handle millions of requests at the same time. So that's the reason we are using Cosmos DB for IoT applications or stream analytics applications. So what is the what is the IoT applications? Suppose if the IoT devices that is Internet of Things sensor devices, maybe a temperature sensor, which is capturing the temperature data. So there can be hundreds of sensors. So each sensor is capturing the temperature data. In every second, every millisecond, it is capturing this temperature and sending that captured information to the cloud for further processing. But in the cloud where you can store the data for processing, such cases we can use Cosmos DB as the storage because Cosmos DB supports high volume of uh, data storage and also it can handle uh, massive transactions at the same time. Elastically scalable to meet the application needs. Yes, you can configure the auto scale for storage and capacity 
for your Cosmos DB. So if you want, you can uh, increase the throughput and the storage capacity by scaling. Okay, so you can increase the storage capacity and also you can configure auto scaling for your uh, throughput. Means you can allocate a uh, minimum capacity and based on the number of requests or based on the uh, traffic, you can auto scale to a particular limit. So you can set to the minimum and maximum uh, for uh, the capacity configuration. So mostly we use Cosmos DB for your web applications, retail applications, IoT devices or IoT applications, gaming solutions, and also mobile applications. So here you can see some of the use cases, the diagram which shows like uh, the IoT, if you see the IoT hub is capturing the data from various sensors and then send it to the Azure Stream Analytics. The Stream Analytics capturing that high volume of data and storing into Cosmos DB so that it can be later processed by Synapse Analytics. In retail and marketing, you can see your front-end application can send the data to the backend database solutions, and that can be then connected to the AI search service. For example, for product recommendations, okay, or product feature search, you can use the Azure AI search service, which read the data from Cosmos DB and enable uh, uh, full text search. So you can use uh, the Cosmos DB for different uh, use cases, including IoT, retail, online storefront, web and mobile applications. So you can find out more uh, use cases and the architectural diagrams from the Microsoft uh, documentation site. So now let's understand and create the Cosmos DB for NoSQL. If you see, this is the structure of a Cosmos DB account. That means we will have the account at the top level. Inside the account, we can have databases. That means multiple databases we can have. And inside the database, we can have a one or more containers, which is equivalent to the tables. And inside the containers, we have the items, which is the JSON documents. So as I have mentioned, the account is coming at the top level and it provides a URI and an authentication key. So a URI looks like this, that is HTTPS colon double slash, then a unique account name. So the account name you will be providing at the time of creating the Cosmos DB. So suppose if I'm creating a new Cosmos DB account, it will ask you to provide a unique account name, so that account name will be part of the URL. So HTTPS colon double slash account name dot documents dot Azure dot will be the URL for your uh, Cosmos DB account. And for authenticating the request, you have to use an uh, API key or the, the Cosmos DB account key. 
So there will be two keys will be provided. You can use key one or key two, or sometimes some uh, SDKs allow you to use the connection string, like a database connection string, which contains the key and endpoint. Now we have the database. A database is similar to a database in your relational database solutions where it contains multiple tables, but here it contains multiple containers. So inside one account, you can have multiple databases and each database can have a separate capacity allocated. So you can allocate uh, a request unit capacity for your database. For example, I can, if I want, I can allocate 500 RU. RU means the request capacity or request unit. So I can allocate uh, a minimum of uh, 500 RU to the database and all the containers which is part of that database will share that capacity. But the problem with this approach means if you are allocating the capacity at the database level, the problem is it will be shared by multiple containers. Suppose if there is a container which is uh, performing or which is having more read-write operations so that consumes more capacity. But yes, it is possible that we can allocate capacity at container level also. A container is similar to the tables in relational database, which contains the records. But here the records are called items, which means the documents. A container can have other server side objects like a stored procedure, user defined functions, and also the triggers. So here you can see the container will contain the items and the server side objects like a procedures, triggers, functions, and other concurrency management parameters. So here is the Azure portal UI that you can uh, use to create a Cosmos DB account. So I have already showed you this option, this window. We will go and create a simple Cosmos DB account. Once the Cosmos DB account is created, then you are supposed to create a database inside of it. So here you can see while creating the new database, you need to provide a database ID. A database ID is just the name of the database. It should be in lowercase and also no special characters allowed. So you can use a simple string. Okay, so that is the standard and naming convention. And you can see here an option for provisioning throughput. There is a checkbox for provision throughput, which means you can allocate the capacity, the throughput capacity at the database level. Okay, and there are two options to allocate the throughput. One is auto scale and the manual. Manual means you can allocate a fixed capacity. For example, I don't want to increase or decrease the capacity. I want to go with a stable capacity, maybe 1000 RU. So you can see the RU is the request unit. Okay. So what is the RU you want to allocate? Suppose if I want to use uh, a 1000 RU, consistent uh, 1000 RU means whether the number of requests is higher or less, always 1000 RU will be allocated. But auto scale is a better option if you don't know 
the usage of your application. Suppose sometimes the application usage is higher, sometimes the usage is lower. Such cases, you can specify the auto scale option. So if you select the auto scale, you can configure a max RU, that is maximum request unit, because uh, if you don't set the max limit, it can go up to the max, uh, database maximum value. It will increase the cost. So to control the cost, it is better to set a max RU value. And it is also possible to calculate the cost of uh, your database uh, based on the RU. Okay, so below itself, it will show what is the RU uh, allocated and, uh, and what is the cost for that. So here you can see estimated monthly cost. Okay, so if you create in one region, then you have to pay Suppose if it is $100, you have to pay for one region. And when you replicate this to another region, then it will become $200 because you are reading and writing in two regions. When you replicate to a third region, it will be $300. So that means the cost is also based on the number, number of regions you use. Okay, So not only the throughput capacity, the cost is also depends on the number of regions uh, that you use for replication. Once the database is created, inside the database, you can create a container. Container is nothing but the collection. So you can create a new database and then create the container inside it, or you can use an existing database. So if you go with the date, new database and create new option, then you can create the database now and now itself. That means at the same time of creating the container. Or if you select this option that is use existing, which means you will be uh, selecting an existing database which is already created. Okay. And if you create a database, uh, you can specify here share the throughput across containers, which means what is the capacity of the database that you have allocated, maybe 1000 RU if you have allocated, it will be shared by all the containers within that database. Suppose if you already have three containers, they will share the capacity. Okay, But if you uncheck this option, you will be getting an option to allocate the capacity for the container specifically. That means container level capacity you can configure. Okay. And here you can specify the container ID. So this is a database ID. Then specify whether you want to share the capacity across containers or and then you can configure the throughput whether it is manual or auto scale. That's for the database. And inside that database, you can create a container. So that container's ID need to be specified here. And every container will have a partition key. So partitioning is an important feature of NoSQL databases because every NoSQL database uses, uh, most of the NoSQL databases supports a partition key which allow you to scale out your data. Suppose if you want to store your data in Cosmos DB, based on the partition key, it allocates your data or it will store the data in different logical partitions. And these logical partitions are part of the physical partitions. So that comes in a different module. We will talk about the partitioning strategies and all. But anyway, there is a partition key required and partition key when you specify, you have to provide a uh, forward slash. Okay, so you can give a slash and then the name of the partition key. After the container is created, inside the container, you can create a item. 
So item means it is a document. So you can use this new item button to create a new document. A document by default looks like this. That means there will be an ID field, which is a mandatory field. ID is a mandatory column. So by default, it comes with this string value. And you, if you want, you can replace with your own ID, maybe some number you can provide or alphanumeric characters you can provide. Okay. If you are removing the ID and trying to insert the document, it automatically generate an ID. A random ID will be generated. Okay, I'll show you that. So here, left side, you can see this is the data explorer. In the data explorer, you can see the ID. ID is acting as the primary key, and this is the partition key. Okay. So uh, your current record goes to which partitions, which uh, ID. So that will show here. And you can see there is an SQL type of query syntax, select star from C. So that means we can use an SQL type of query syntax to read the data from NoSQL database. So Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL supports SQL type of query syntax. It's not SQL, looks like SQL, but it is not exactly SQL. It looks like SQL. So I have mentioned earlier that for helping the developers to uh, helping the developers to understand the Cosmos DB querying mechanism, because they, are, they may be familiar with the relational databases. So they will be familiar with the uh, SQL queries. So the same SQL syntax they can follow here. So now we will see how to create a Cosmos DB account. So let us go to the Azure portal. As you see, this is the Azure portal. Inside the Azure portal, you can search for Cosmos DB. So if your Cosmos DB icon is appearing in the home page, you can click on that. Then it will show all the already existing Cosmos DB accounts. So you can see I already have one Cosmos DB account. But I will create a new one. So for that, I can click on this create, which gives the same window. You can see the six APIs currently supported. But I said we will be always building the new cloud native applications using only this API. The other APIs are primarily used for migration purpose. So we go to the NoSQL database. So here you can specify the subscription and the resource group. So under the subscription, you can see the subscription name and resource group. You can select an existing resource group or you can specify a new resource group. A resource group is just a logical container, means a logical group. If you want to place all your Azure services inside a logical container, that logical group or logical container is called a resource group. So I'm giving this as DP420 group. So this is my resource group name. And here I can specify the account name. So account name should be globally unique because I have mentioned it will be a part of your endpoint. So to make this endpoint unique, this account name should be globally unique. For example, if I say sample, then it will say this is not available because it's already someone has used this name. Or if I say maybe uh, my account, you say, this is also not available. So you have 
to choose a name which is unique. So for that, what I am going to do, I'll say sin hyphen cosmos hyphen 2024. So I'm just using this name. Now you can see a tick mark in the right side, right? So which means this name is available. So I just made it unique by providing uh, some numbers and uh, some char additional characters. Then you can specify whether you want to use availability zones for creating this database. That means it will be created in specific availability zones or you want to disable the availability zone option. Okay, so we can go with the disable option and location you have to select. So which location you have to use for storing for creating your database. So I can use Central India. So I'm selecting Central India. And capacity mode, you can specify. Capacity mode means whether you want to go with a fixed capacity mode pattern or you want to go with the serverless pattern. So we'll discuss about the difference later. So currently I'll go with the provisioned throughput model. And below there is an option like apply free tier discount, which means in every subscription, there is one Cosmos DB account, which is free. Free means there is a limitation that maximum 1000 RU per second and 25 GB maximum storage. Okay, so that means if you use the free tier, you can use it only for the dev and test scenarios. For the production level scenarios, we never use the free tier. Okay, I think I have already used the free tier, so I cannot create a second database using free tier. So I'll go with the do not apply, which means I don't want the free tier option. Then limit total account throughput. So here limit the total account throughput that can be provisioned on the account. So do you want to set a max limit for your throughput that you can allocate? Means, uh, for example, if I have to uh, specify for the database maximum 5000 R, you can be allocated maximum. So that limit, if you want to apply, you can set. Next. In the next page, you can see geo redundancy means do you want to enable geo replication option? Okay, so I think this Central India location is not supporting that. So let me select a US location. Okay, so I selected the Southeast Asia, which is Singapore, but this is due to the location you have selected, a backup only storage redundancy option must be selected. Okay, fine. So anyway, here, geo redundancy you can enable. So the settings may be enabled or disabled based on the uh location because some locations some features may not be supported okay so that you have to understand all the features are not available in all the locations so depends on the location some features may be enabled or disabled so here geo replication or geo redundancy if you want you can enable this now or you can enable this later also okay so I'm not doing this now. We'll do it later. 
and multi region rights so by default if you uh, create or if you enable geo replication it will be creating one primary database or primary location and multiple secondary locations but if you enable the multi region rights all the locations will be writable locations means there is no primary secondary concept every location is primary and every location is secondary but i don't want to go with that networking so if you want to make your database accessible from all the locations then you can select the connectivity method as all networks but if you want to allow the connection only from selected networks then you can use public endpoint but from the selected networks but from the networks if you want to allow private endpoint private endpoint is a connectivity method in azure that transfer the data using the azure backbone network so in that case you can use the azure private endpoint so i'll go with the all networks because i want to connect the database from my local machine let's go to next here you can select the backup policy so do you want to select or go with the periodic backup or continuous backup of 7 days or continuous backup for 30 days and what is a backup interval periodic backup if you select you can go with the backup interval okay so these are pre configured options and periodic backup means you can configure your settings like a backup interval by default is 240 minutes means in every 4 hours it takes a backup and that copy will be re retained for 8 hours that means every time minimum two copies will be there one old copy and one new copy right so that is the copies of the data retained is two two means suppose if now i am taking a copy it takes or it will be stored at for next 8 hours but after 4 hour it will take another copy so that means every time there will be two copies one uh new copy and one old copy right so that is okay. and backup storage redundancy so where you want to store the backup data so if you want to store the backup data within the same region then you can go for locally redundant but if you want to use the different zone then you can go for zone redundant or you can use a different region for geo redundant backup means where the backup data to be stored so i'll go with the low cost one that is locally redundant in encryption so by default any data that you store in azure is encrypted okay it's encrypted by default but for encryption it uses a server managed key which means azure managed key but if you want to use our own custom encryption key you can go with the customer managed encryption key and you have to store your encryption key in a key vault but i don't want to go with that now so let's keep it service managed key if you want you can add the tags not necessary let me review and create so estimated time of creation is 3 minutes and you can wait for the database to get created okay so some questions has come okay so shubham has asked this session will be helpful for aspiring data scientists and 
data analyst? Yes, obviously, because for data scientists and data analysts, one of the most commonly used uh, data service is Cosmos DB, because for stream analytics, Apache Spark or uh, stream, oh, sorry, the AI ML, for all scenarios, we will be using the Cosmos DB. So obviously, as a data scientist, it will be helpful for you how to integrate it with different services. Can we use NoSQL for relation data? So relation data, if you are talking about the foreign key relations, uh, there is no separate relation tables required because inside the NoSQL databases like a JSON storages or document storages, we will be storing the data in the uh, hierarchical format, which means JSON format, which contains all the related entries within that document itself. So there is no separate relational table or relations required. Inside the document, single document, all the related in informations can be stored, means relations supported. Is it also used as vector DB? Okay. So I hope this you are from the AI background. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Cosmos DB for MongoDB is currently supporting the vector storage option. So I said uh, Cosmos DB supports MongoDB API. You can use Azure Cosmos DB for uh, MongoDB as a vector storage for your AI applications when you implement the RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generations. Uh, because it supports the vector embeddings. For the NoSQL APIs, currently it is in preview. It is not fully implemented, but it is in the preview stage. But yes, maybe going ahead uh, in another uh, six month or uh, one year, you will be able to see Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL as a vector storage. What is container level? So if you are configuring the capacity for a particular container, then it is called the container level configuration. Ninety-nine point nine percentage like yesterday. I didn't understand that. Is re Cosmos DB is re regional construct. So yes, you know, uh, we will we need to provision this service in a particular region, and you can replicate that into different other locations. If, what is the cost associated with these features to have? So no, these are this is a managed uh, database. All the features are pre-configured, and you don't need to pay anything additionally for these features. Okay, all the features are available in the managed database. You will be paying for the capacity that you provision, and also if you enable geo replication then you will be paying additionally for the secondary region also. But for enabling the features, you don't need to pay additionally. According to your application requirement, you can configure. But the cost is calculated based on the amount of data stored and also the capacity allocated. Okay, so here you can see now the database is database account is created. If I go to the resource, you can see this is the Cosmos DB account, which is in the top level. So inside this, you will be able to see the 
configurations parameters like the resource group, subscription, subscription ID, the read locations. This is the URI. Can you see this is the URI for your database? And also you can see the authentication key. So here you can see the URI as well as the primary key and the secondary key, which provides read write access. But if you want to provide only read access, you can use the this key. So this is only providing read access. Okay. And there is connection strings available. So you can use connection strings to allow connections from your applications. Okay. And if you go to the quick start section, you can see some of the uh, approaches, sample code. So if you want, you can download a sample application. Means so after creating the container, you can download the sample code for .NET, Java, Node.js, and other variables. Okay. So if you want to start with a simple application, means if you are a beginner, you can simply create a items container and also then uh, download the source code. So you will see how to write code to connect to the uh, databases. So this is the rapid development we have mentioned. So you can easily build your application. You don't need to go and search for any uh, source code. You can see this right there itself. Now, if you come to the data explorer, so here left side, you can see a data explorer. Here we can see our API type is no SQL API. And inside this, you can see there is no database or no container suppose if i have to go and create a new container first i have to create a database so here we have an option for new database or new container so if i have to create only the database i can go with new database or i can go with new container which allow us to create the new database also if not exist okay. so i'll first create a new database select the name as sample db here is an option to provision the throughput okay so you can allocate the capacity for your database if you go with auto scale you can select the maximum ru but if you select manual then you can set a fixed capacity mode so like a maybe 1000 ru so 1000 RU will be allocated for your database. So what is the cost that you can see? But if you go to auto scale, okay, so then you can select the maximum RU. That, that means it depends on the usage, the capacity allocation will be varying. So I'll go with auto scale, no issues. So now you can see the sample DB is created, but there is no containers inside it. So we can go and create a new container. Here, I can create the database if I don't have, or if, if I already have, I can use existing database. 
I'll select this sample DB, then specify the container that is collection name. Maybe I can specify products collection and partition key. So you have to specify a, a column, which is a mandatory column that is used to distribute the data across multiple partitions. So I'll select product category as the partition key. Or if you want, you can use ID itself as the partition key, it's your wish. The values double this button. Yeah, it is not uh, enabling this. There is something wrong with the UI. It's not enabling this button. Let's create the
Okay, I think this is now enabled. So it's possible to allocate dedicated throughput for this. Okay, so if means uh, for the database, we have allocated a maximum capacity, but if you want, you can also allocate dedicated throughput for this. Okay, so because of this uh, uh, UI, this data explorer UI, there is a limit of I think 5000 RU or something. So if you exceed that limit, it won't allow. So I just uh, disabled it. So maybe I want to allocate 500 RU dedicatedly for this. Okay. So this is the product container. So if you select this option that is provision dedicated throughput for the container, uh, it does not touch the capacity which is allocated in the database level. For this, it will dedicatedly allocate a different capacity. Okay, so that means, so maybe in some cases, uh, within one database, I have five collections, and one collection will be one of the uh, most commonly used one. And the remaining four co uh, collections will be, means collection means containers, will be uh, not frequently used. So for the frequently used container, I want to provide a dedicated throughput because that is very, very important. Okay, and I have to make sure that there is a high performance required for that container. So for that container, I can allocate dedicated capacity and for remaining four, they can share the total capacity. So that way you can configure. So here, if you provide this, it will you can specify a capacity here which will be dedicatedly allocated for this particular container okay so if you have other containers then they will share the database total capacity but i don't want to go with that because we are we are going to test with only one container so it will use or it will share the capacity of your database so you can see now this button is enabled. It's because uh, the UI is supporting maximum 5,000 RU. Uh, so if the total is exceeding that limit, it won't allow. So that's why. So anyway, <clears throat> so I am giving OK. So here you can see now the uh, container has been created. Inside this container, you can see the items option. Okay. I'll insert a single document. And here we can go to new item. And here you can see ID is the primary key and category which is the partition key so here we can remove this id so it will auto generate i can add the other attributes maybe product name is apple Goods, price, vendors. So I'm going to store this as an array of vendors. The vendor name.
So here you can see I have created a sample. Document, as you can see. So this sample document contains name that is uh, uh, name and the partition key that is category, price, quantity, vendors. And these are the different vendors we have, and we will be storing that information inside the document itself. So there is no foreign key relationship required with the other uh, collections. So because all the related information we store, we store inside this itself. So you can see this is the collection type. Now when I save this, you can see when I save this data, it uh, automatically add an ID here, right? So you can see an ID here. Along with that, it automatically adds some extra information. So ID is anyway mandatory because ID is the primary key. And you can also see some additional attributes, which is uh, for the consistency and concurrence manage concurrency management used by Cosmos DB for the timestamp attachments, e tag, and so on. So that is for the internal purpose, so that we don't need to worry. Our document is only up to this. It is the uh, document data, and these are the internal uh, usage. Okay. So this is one document. If you want, you can also create another document. Say, same way you will be able to add a, a new document. So here you can see the documents which you can, which you have created. So here, Left side, you can see the ID as well as the category. So when you add more and more documents, you'll be able to see that here. So this is the JSON document, which is stored in the Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL. And one more interesting thing which I have to show here, I can open a query window Inside this query window, you can see there is an SQL type of query. You can write select star from C. C means collection or container. So then C means the current container, which is our uh, uh, products container. When I execute this query, you can see it uh, shows the result here below. But if you don't want all the records, or sorry, all the fields, you can so specify c dot name comma c dot price and then execute then it shows only the name and price right so the sql type of query we can use for querying the data that is a benefit of uh, azure cosmos db for no sql but in cosmos db sorry uh, mongodb you cannot use this type of SQL syntax to query the data. Okay, so Microsoft has made it very simple for developers because developers who are familiar with uh, relational databases can uh, now query the data from NoSQL database using the similar syntax. Even you can write the where condition also, where C dot price is greater than 500. If there is a record, then it displays. Okay, suppose if it is 300, then it shows because this is 320. Right? So that means you can write SQL like syntax to query the data in Azure Cosmos DB4 NoSQL. Okay. So that's the fundamental things we have to understand from the module one, how to create the Cosmos DB account and how to create a collection that is container, insert the items and query the items. So now let's go for a break. Let's take a 15 minutes break and then we will continue after that. So let's take a small break.
Hello, everyone. All are back. Okay, so let's move to the next. This is the second module. And in this module, we are trying to understand the resource requirements, configuring the Cosmos DB throughput, and moving data in, into, and out of the Cosmos DB for NoSQL. So, how we can connect with the different services. So first, to configure this database, we need to understand what is throughput. Throughput is the capacity that we allocate to the database. It is usually calculated in a unit called RU. RU is a request unit. You can provision the throughput at either or both the database and container levels. So I have showed you in the previous example. When we create the database or a container, we can configure the throughput, which can be a shared capacity at the database level or a dedicated capacity at the container level. If you allocate a capacity at the database level, you can share the total capacity across all the containers within that database. But if you feel that one of the container need a dedicated throughput, then you can specify dedicated throughput for that particular container so that it will get a constant capacity or constant performance compared to the other containers. Because when you use a shared capacity model, we cannot predict how much capacity will be allocated to that particular container. So the read and read write performance can vary means the performance can vary because it's a shared throughput. So if you feel that the, the, the container requires a constant uh, performance, then you have to go for a dedicated capacity model. The throughput can be allocated in an auto scale mode or a manual mode. So in the auto scale mode, you have to set a max capacity level, which means when the demand is less, when the number of requests is less, it will run with no capacity or minimum capacity. And if the number of requests increases, 
it will allocate more capacity and scale up to the maximum allocated one. But in a manual capacity mode, you will be allocating a fixed capacity. So always it uh, uses a fixed capacity. So in uh, that case, the cost is predictable. So we can predict what will be the cost because it always runs with a fixed capacity mode. But in auto scale, we cannot predict the cost because sometimes the capacity will be high, which is allocated, or sometimes low capacity will be allocated. Depends on the usage or depends on the demand. So cost cannot be predicted. Each container is a unit of scalability for both throughput and storage. So each container you can allocate the throughput and the storage. So here you can see database level throughput when you provision, you create a database, allocate the throughput that is request unit, and that will be shared by all the containers. But container level throughput means you will be allocating dedicated capacity for each container. Maybe some container requires more throughput, some container requires less throughput. It depends on the usage of that container. But you can also go with mixed throughput model, which means one container will have dedicated throughput. Remaining containers will share the capacity of database. That is the mixed throughput provisioning model. So for database level, you will be allocating a fixed capacity. That is maybe here as per the example, you can see 6000 RU allocated at the database level. So the first two containers will share them. So we cannot predict how much it will get for the first container and how much will be allocated for the second container. They will be sharing it. But for the third container, we are separately allocating a throughput that is dedicated throughput. How this request unit is calculated? So request unit is calculated based on the operations. So if you see, it is a rate-based currency that every request consumes a fixed number of request unit. That means, so usually one RU, one RU means what is the capacity required? Usually one RU means one read operation of one KB document. Suppose if I have one KB document, for reading that one KB document, how much CPU and memory we need? That is one RU. But that is in case of read. But for insert operation, we need a more RU because insert operation requires more capacity than read operation. So you can say uh, insert operation may require five or six RU. So one KB write may requires five to six RU. Update may be required 10 RU. Okay. So it depends. So you can see that in the uh, request unit calculator. I'll show you that. So the RU means one read of one KB document, that is one RU. But when it comes to write, for writing one KB of data, how much RU is required? Usually it is, I think it's five to six. Are you required? Similarly, for update, delete, and query operation, you will be requiring uh, more RUs. So evaluate the consumption to estimate the needed request unit capacity. So here you can see to write single document, the number of requests per second, 
is 10,000 and number of RU per request is 10, then you need a 1 lakh RUs required. So that is the calculation. Similarly, for top query, that means one read query when you execute, 700 request per second is coming and each request requires 100 RU. Then 700 into 100, that is 70,000 RU required. So this is the calculation comes. Okay. So how many read you are expecting? How many write operations you are expecting? How many delete operations you are expecting? So you will be calculating that with the required capacity and multiply and then take the total of all this. That means suppose I'm expecting 1 lakh read operations per second and each read requires 1 KB or 2 KB, whatever it is. Okay. So how many total capacity required only for the read? Then for write, how many write operations we are expecting per second? Maybe five write operations per second. And each write operation requires maybe 10 RU. So 5 into 10, 50. Then how many delete operations we are expecting per second? Multiply with the capacity required for that. Then we take the total of all RUs for read, write, in uh, update, and query. So we'll take the total of all RUs, and that is uh, converted into the currency. Means how much RU you are consuming, then based on that, the cost is calculated. For that, we can use a capacity calculator. Cosmos DB capacity calculator because manually calculating this will be quite difficult. But if you want to estimate the cost of Cosmos DB, you can use capacity calculator. It uses your existing data workload details and estimates storage and throughput requirements. So you can specify what is the amount of data that you are going to store and how many read and write you are expecting. Based on that, it will calculate the cost. And you can translate this into a cost estimate. So you can export that cost. Okay. So you can uh, uh, get the summary of the total estimation. So let's see how to do that. So here you can say Cosmos DB capacity calculator. You can search and you will see this is the Cosmos DB capacity calculator. So here you can select which API you are planning to use. So in our case, it is Cosmos DB for NoSQL, but it, it is possible for MongoDB and Cassandra also, but we will go with NoSQL. And here you can specify how many regions you are planning to use. Because I said, depends on the number of regions, the cost will multiply. Okay. So currently I'm selecting one region cost and then here I'll be uh, specifying the total data stored in the transaction store. So what is the amount of data you are planning to store? Suppose if I am planning to store 50 GB of data. Okay. So you want to use analytical store. You can specify for analytics store, what is the amount of data? That means the logs and other informations. Okay. That if you don't want to use, just calculate the capacity only for the database storage. And below you can specify the item size. Okay. So this is maximum up to 2 uh, MB, that is 2048 KB. But here you can specify. So this is, I said, 1 RU means 
usually one read of one KB data. So we can calculate in KB. So if your one document, one item or one record is one KB, we can specify point reads per second in max read region. Suppose how many read operations you are expecting per second. Suppose if it is 50, then it will be calculating for the 50 read operations. Suppose if you are expecting 100 reads, you can specify that. Create operations. So how many create operations per second across all regions? So here you can specify that. Maybe I am expecting 10 write operations. Updates, so maybe 5 only. Or maybe this also will keep it 10 to calculate. Deletes. Suppose if I need a uh, five delete operations or maybe one delete operation. And queries across all regions is one. Then we can calculate. So when you calculate right side, it will show the summary. So here you can see what is the total amount required per month. You can see it's 35 US dollar. Okay. So you can see the details. Post per GB per month, that is 0 0.25 US dollar per GB. Per GB per month. So total data I have mentioned is 50 GB. So 50 into 0 0.25 is 12.50 US dollar. So that means for storage, I have to spend 12.5 US dollar. And cost per 100 RU per hour. That is this one. This is per 100 RU per hour. So estimated throughput required is 400 RU. That is a minimum that we usually use. So in our case, show the details. So here you can see throughput for queries, 10 RU, so because I am saying here number of queries is one. So one query means 10 RU. Okay. Number of read points reads, that is 100 RU, because 100 read operation means 1 KB means 1 RU means 1 KB of 1 read, right? So that means 100 read means 100 K RU will come. So that is this. Throughput for create. Create operation here I mentioned 10. So for 10 create operations, 50 RU required. That means for 1 create, 5 RU is required. For update, 99 RUs. That is. 10 update operation I have mentioned. So one update is usually takes 9 RU. So that is so 9.9 .9 something. So anyway, so almost a 10 is required. So you can see update is getting 99 RU. Delete. So here I mentioned one delete. So one delete means 5 RU. So minimum throughput we have to allocate is 400 because this is not coming total of 400. So minimum 400 will be allocated. So that is a minimum capacity. Okay. But if you are expecting more read and more write, you can specify that here. Maybe I'm expecting uh, 4,500 reads and uh, 20 writes recalculate so minimum 400 so that is fixed so a minimum amount is coming but here it is now the after recalculation 713 ru is coming so 713 ru is multiplied by this is 100 ru per hour okay so that is 0 0.008 so you have to multiply by uh, 24 for one day post and this is for 100 RU. So 700 means 
multiplied by 7 something. So total will come 41. So 41 dollar for the throughput cost. Okay. And the total cost including the storage and the throughput is 54. Okay. So that is the cost calculation. So you can see. So 500 read operation for 1 KB is 500 RU. Then 20 create operation. So that is 99 RU. 10 update operations. 99 RU. One delete operation is 5 RU. So total 713 RU required. So the total cost is this. Okay. So you can estimate what is the amount you have to spend per month for Cosmos DB. So that is the capacity calculator. So it's just an estimation. Okay. Now time to live. The time to live is defined in seconds uh, from the last modification. So when the document is last modified, from that time it calculates the time to live value. So what is the time to live? So time to live is a field or value that you can use to automatically delete the records. Okay, so for example, I want to automatically delete all the records which is older than 10 days or 20 days. So you can specify the time to leave value inside the JSON object. So it's configured using the default time to leave property of the containers JSON object. It can be overridden as per item basis. Okay, it depends on uh, the document, you can modify this value. Once set, means if you're setting this, documents will be automatically be purged at the specified time since they were last modified. And from the last modification time, it will be checking whether that expiry is reached or not. For example, if you have given 10 days, so from now, Suppose now you are inserting the record, it will look whether the record has uh, reached 10 days okay, from the last modification. If it is crossing that time to leave period, then it will automatically remove that. The maximum value is this one. What is that? 2147483647. So you can specify that as the maximum if you want. That is if you are setting. If you are not setting this value, then there is no time to live. Okay. Can be used to minimize cost by purging the data that has already been shipped to data warehouse or aggregator. So where this is useful, suppose if you know Cosmos DB is using SSD storage and it also costly service. Okay, compared to the other because it's a provide that much functionalities and features. So uh, Cosmos DB compared to the other storage options, little costly, okay, uh, because of the, the facilities that it provides because it uses high, uh, means premium SSD storage with all the SLA parameters need to be uh, used. So because of that, storing unnecessary data will increase the cost, right? So to avoid that, suppose in case of uh, IoT applications or stream analytics applications, whenever the data is already processed or whenever the data is already, uh, what, moved into some other storages like a, a storage account or data warehouse, we don't need to keep that same copy here. So we can tell, okay, that if the data is already processed, then we can delete the data. There is no need to keep that data here to increase the storage capacity because if you keep the data, 
in cosmos db you have to pay for the storage capacity you saw in the capacity calculator for every gb you will be paying right so to avoid unnecessary cost you can remove this data which is already been moved to another data storage or which has been already processed okay so for that we usually set the ttl default time to leave okay does not exist items are not automatically expired means if the ttl value is not present then it will not expire the record it will be there no no issues but if you set it as minus one the item will not expire by default okay same as the does not exist but if you set a number then it will be deleted automatically after that number of seconds okay in the last after the last modified time so this is mostly used in high volume of data transfer applications like iot applications wherever the data comes where in high volume we immediately process it and then we can delete the processed records okay so such cases we can set the ttl configure the cosmos db for no sql throughput here we need to understand the throughput provisioning mechanisms so i i think you must have noticed while creating the cosmos db we have two options to provision the capacity one is dedicated throughput that is provisioned the throughput and second was serverless okay i'll show you once again if you go back to your azure portal and create a new cosmos db account So here you can see see the provisioned throughput and the serverless so this is the capacity mode okay so how the capacity need to be allocated so provisioned throughput means you will be allocating the capacity okay but in serverless so so far whatever we have discussed is provisioned throughput because we have allocated the capacity for the database or we have allocated the capacity for the container. So that is provisioned throughput model. But in serverless model, we don't need to allocate the capacity. So here you can see when I select provisioned throughput, then you need to specify what is the capacity it to be allocated. But when it goes to serverless, that is not required. So let's understand what is meant by serverless model. Serverless is a concept in cloud, which means we don't need to allocate a dedicated compute capacity for the services. So not only for the database, but also for the compute services uh, or deployment servers like uh, app services, container services, okay, and other database services. If we are not allocating a dedicated server, we can say it is serverless. Okay. Serverless does not mean server is not required. Yes, server is required to execute the operations. But what is the difference is we are not allocating a dedicated server machine. Then how it works? Here it works in the consumption based model means whenever you consume the database or whenever you uh, perform the operation, it allocates the server, then execute the operation, then deallocate automatically. That means wherever the compute is required or wherever the operation is performed, then it allocates the compute capacity. So each request consumes request unit. Yes, same to uh, provision the compute model. Every request is consuming certain amount of RU, that is request unit. But 
we are not allocating that capacity uh, before. Instead of that, it will be allocating the capacity on demand. Means when the operation need to be performed, at that time only the capacity is allocated or the compute is allocated. It eliminates the need to pre-provision throughput RUs ahead of time. So that means we don't need to pre-provision our capacity. So what is the benefit? In case of provisioned compute model, since you have already allocated the compute capacity, whether you are using it or not using it, you have to pay. Okay. For example, if I'm allocating 5,000 RU, but there is no request coming for the month, still you have to pay for that 5,000 RU because you have already allocated the server. Because you, are, you have already allocated the server, you have to pay for it. But in serverless model, it is consumption-based model. Means if you are consuming, then only you, will, you, you need to pay. It, that means for applications which are not very frequently accessed, uh, accessing databases is a good option. So workloads, if you compare, provision is ideal for workloads with the predictable traffic patterns. So we know that it is getting continuous request. Then provision the model is better. Serverless can handle workloads that have widely varying traffics. For example, for some time, there is no traffic. After some time, some traffic is uh, coming, means some heavy traffic is coming. Again, after some time, uh, again, after uh, a period of time, there is no traffic. That means no request coming. Suddenly, again, the number of requests increase. So in such cases, since it is unpredictable, okay, so such cases, you can use a serverless. Request unit allocation. In provisioned model, the number of RUs per second preset to each container because what is the RU that is already allocated to the containers or databases the in, 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 in the provisioned model. But in the serverless model, it doesn't require any planning or automatic provisioning. So when the request comes, it automatically allocate the capacity and execute. There is no need for any planning. Global distribution. Provisioned model can distribute the data to an unlimited number of Azure regions. Okay, that means you can geo replicate to any number of Azure regions. In serverless model, accounts can only run in a single Azure region. That you have to consider if you are planning to enable geo replication, then you have to go for provisioned compute model because it will require asynchronous replication to other regions. But in serverless model, compute capacity is allocated only for the execution of the current request. Okay, so that means you cannot do the geo replication. Compare storage limit. In provision model, unlimited data in a container. That means in one container, any amount of data you can store. But in serverless model, up to 50 GP of data in a container. Okay, maximum 50 GP data you can store in one container. Now let's understand what is auto scale throughput and standard throughput difference. Auto scale throughput defines a range of uh, request unit per second 
to scale the database of container. So you can define a range, right? Usually we set a max limit. You must have seen when you go for auto scale, there is an option to configure what is the maximum RU that needs to be allocated. So minimum is, I think 400 is the minimum which you have to allocate. But anyway, maximum you can allocate according to your requirement. So if you are expecting more traffic, you can set more capacity. If you are uh, uh, expecting less traffic, then you can set a less capacity. So auto scaling means you can you will be setting a range, a minimum and maximum. So minimum is 400 and maximum you can set. Is a great for workloads that with a variable or unpredictable traffic pattern. So if you don't know the actual usage of the uh, application, means if the application sometimes will be generating high traffic, sometimes it generates less traffic. In such scenarios, you can go with auto scale option because it's not allocating a fixed capacity. Okay, so auto scale, when the demand increases, capacity increases. When the demand decreases, capacity decreases. Can minimize unused capacity that would typically be pre-provisioned. So when you pre-provision the capacity, the problem is sometime it can, it can be unused. That means we are provisioning it, but we are not using it, right? But that problem will not come here when you enable auto scale because when the demand or when the request comes, then it allocates according to the requirement. Existing containers can be migrated to and from auto scale. So I think you must have noticed when the container was not able to create, I I have I gone through. I gone to the uh, the auto scale section and modified the scale limit. If you see here, we can go to the scale. This is the database scaling configuration. And here you can configure whether you want auto scale and you can switch to manual or from manual, you can switch to auto scale. So now comparing the auto scale and the standard throughput. Standard is suitable for workloads with a steady traffic. So standard means pre-provisioned manual uh, capacity allocation. So that is better if you know that, okay, there is a steady traffic, means always a fixed amount of data comes. Like in IoT applications, so every second it generates maybe 1 million records. Okay, so it means if there are 100 or 1000 sensors, that 1000 sensors generates 1000 into maybe 100. So that number of records every, every second. So that depends. Okay, so you can calculate, okay, this is the amount of data that comes every time. So such cases, wherever the predictable uh, usage is there, then standard model is okay. Auto scale is suitable for unpredictable traffic because if you don't know when the demand increases, when the demand decreases, then better to use auto scale option. Standard RU requires a static number of request units to be assigned ahead of time. So you have to assign a fixed number of capacity for the container or database. But in auto scale, you only set to the maximum RU. So there is no need to set to the fixed capacity. Maximum up to what you can go. That is configured. Scenarios. Standard 
is where the application throughput can be actually predicted. And auto scale is where the application throughput cannot be accurately predicted, but an acceptable maximum throughput can be assigned. So yes, I know maximum this much come, but actual I don't know. Such cases we can go for the auto scale. Rate limiting in standard. Since the RUs are static, requests beyond this will be rate limited. Means since you are allocating a fixed capacity, like for, for example, if you are allocating 1000 RU, okay, so it will always provide a 1000 RU capacity. But if more number of requests comes and it will require more capacity, it cannot handle that. Means the request will be rate limited or throttle. But in auto scale, will scale up to the maximum. Means since you have set to the maximum, uh, suppose currently the minimum is going on. And when the demand increases, it automatically increase, increase, increase up to the maximum. Okay. Then only it will rate limited. So creating a server less and provision uh, account. So there is a lab available for that. So uh, I have already showed you how the provision account can be created. So if you want, you can also create a serverless account. So there is uh, labs available for that. So currently we are not doing any labs since you are not doing any hands-on. So I can show you or I can share the links for the labs. This is a thing old one. Yeah. This is the new one. So here, this is the lab you are supposed to do. Like uh, <clears throat> creating a serverless account and a uh, provisioned account. It's very simple. You just need to create a database and create the container by following the steps. So I'll be sharing the links for this uh, lab documents. You can do it anytime later. If you are interested, you can try out this labs using your own Azure subscription. See, uh, this contains the labs for each and every module and the instructions are provided inside. You can see. Step by step instructions are there. OK. So I have already showed you how the provision compute model or the provision the uh, compute model database is created. So if you want to try the serverless model, the similar way you can create it. Just need to select same API and select the same resource group and account name you can say. I'm just giving the name as this. This time I'll be selecting serverless. As you can see, serverless option is selected. You can see in, when you select serverless, Geo redundancy is disabled. 
networking and other features are live as it is. It's taking some time to create. It's taking some time. Yep, you can see it's now created. So here you can see it provides a similar interface. And here you can go and create your database and the containers. Suppose if you want to create a new database, you can specify that. And you can see it's not asking about the capacity anywhere, right? So in previous one or previous model, whenever we create a database, it will be asking whether you want to allocate uh, auto scale or manual capacity, and you want to share the 
capacity across containers. So that capacity related options was coming. But now you can see it's not asking anything about the capacity, right? Because here the capacity is automatically allocated based on the usage. OK, so that is serverless. I'm not creating this, but yes, you can see. In this, otherwise the, the, the execution, everything will be same. The allocation of capacity is uh, dynamic, which means the Azure will decide what should be the capacity need to be allocated based on the number of requests. Okay. So that's in the serverless model. So that's it uh, uh, for now. So now it's uh, almost one o'clock. So we'll take a break for lunch now. So uh, I have shared the labs links once again. If you want, if you are interested, you can do the labs by going into this labs documents. We'll take a break now for one hour. So this will be a lunch break. So at two o'clock we will be continuing. So let's go for the break.
Hello everyone, all are back. 